Hello, everyone. I welcome you back to the Carly P. Riley Show, and the world welcomes Jon Stewart back to The Daily Show for one night a week and at least through February. <laughs> What's so funny to me about this whole situation, and in case you missed it, Jon Stewart is coming back to The Daily Show as an executive producer, and he will host the show on just Monday nights, so one night a week. What's so funny to me about this is that when Jon left The Daily Show in 2015, part of the reason was he wanted to spend more time with his family, and he had asked Comedy Central if he could take the summers off, and Comedy Central had said no. And now, <laughs> 10 years later, Comedy Central is so desperate for a host for The Daily Show and for like a good host that they are bending over backwards to get John to do it. John is now doing it one day a week. Like forget summers off. He only has to do this show one day a week. I am very excited that John is coming back to The Daily Show. I think he was a voice of a generation, but not everyone is, uh, is quite so happy. Specifically, Meghan McCain said that she used to like John, but that he is now morphed into a woke creature. And she is clearly not exactly excited that he will be back on the airwaves in his old seat at The Daily Show. But is she right? Today's episode is about how Jon Stewart's Daily Show fundamentally changed the news and criticized the news, and then may have also ultimately fed the news beast that he was trying to destroy. But before we dive in, if you have been enjoying this content, we're gonna have a lot more of it this year. We're getting the machine rolling again. Please do consider subscribing to the channel, liking this video, leaving a comment. I really love hearing what y'all have to think. So I appreciate it. All right, let's dive in. So a little bit of history here. Jon Stewart took over The Daily Show in 1999 from a comedian named Craig Kilborn. Craig had been doing the show since it launched in 1996 until 1998. And this was really, in some ways, Jon's last shot. He was a 37-year-old comedian, so he was not exactly like young by show business standards. He had been a stand-up comedian for 12 years at that point. He had already had two failed TV shows, and he had been close to getting a late-night show on NBC, but ultimately was passed up for that job. And now Comedy Central was not seen as a particularly prestigious gig back at that point, but John needed a win. So he took the job and this was, he needed to make this work, right? The stakes for John were very high. Out the gate, things were a little rocky, certainly especially with the staff. Because while Comedy Central was not necessarily prestigious, The Daily Show had an audience and it was growing and it was, a, it was definitely seen as a, as a success story on Com Comedy Central. And so the staffers that had worked on that show for the last two years under Craig Kilborn were understandably protective and defensive of the show that they had been making. And they wanted it to continue in that exact same vein. But unfortunately, the show that they had been making did not really jive with John's vision of what he thought the show could be, his own sensibility as a comedian and what he wanted to do with the show. The way John has described The Daily Show before he took over was it was like a bunch of kids blowing spitballs from the back of the room. And I think that's a really apt metaphor. There was definitely an audience that enjoyed laughing at the spitball blowing, but it was also not exactly like biting incisive commentary. For example, they would mock politicians and they, they would make fun of politics but it was often like a politician tripped at the podium and ha ha, isn't that funny? It wasn't an intellectual grappling with their fundamental ideas or core beliefs or the hypocrisy embedded within their worldview. And then there was also a whole part of the Craig Kilborn Daily Show that was just fully goofy. It was created from weird people doing weird things on the internet. And, you know, just because some eccentric was caught on camera somewhere, they would do a bit about it or make a headline about it. And this was something that made John really uncomfortable. And in fact, it actually made some of John's early allies uncomfortable too. One of the first correspondents that came on as part of John's Daily Show was Steve Carell, who was a little known comedian at the time, but who was clearly in John's camp from the day he got there. He talked about these more oddball, eccentric, focused pieces and how much he didn't like them. And this is what Steve Carell said about it years later. He said, the field pieces with eccentrics and oddballs, those were uncomfortable for all of us. I don't wanna say I almost didn't do the show, but I had some major reservations about doing it for exactly that reason, because I didn't like the idea of making fun of people only because they were eccentric or different. So basically John wanted to take The Daily Show and 
retool it so that they were wielding this weapon against intentional targets. And what John wanted to do was go after centers of power, politicians, the media, people who who actually had influence, as opposed to just making fun of the woman at Walmart who tripped. He did things like call out the inaction of Congress or the hypocrisy of politicians who really wanted to grandstand about an issue in front of the cameras, but then didn't actually want to do the hard work of negotiating and making real change happen for the American public. And I think it's hard to overstate how important this change to The Daily Show ultimately was and how important The Daily Show itself became to a swath of Americans. I mean, it really did become so much more than just a 30-minute comedy show. At the end of The Daily Show's run, 12% of Americans said they were getting their news primarily from The Daily Show. I think at other points in its history, it was even higher than that. And even 12% was on par with other major newspapers. But more than that, John gave voice to things that were really frustrating to people and, and, and issues and ideas that people really felt but couldn't necessarily themselves articulate. And he was doing it in a way that was very funny and entertaining. It really just feels like it's one of these moments where it was the right man for the right time. Because in addition to The Daily Show, do you know what other news programs began in 1996? MSNBC and Fox News. So both MSNBC and Fox News started within months of The Daily Show launching, which means that when John took over the show in 1999, these cable news networks were two, three years old, and The Daily Show and Jon Stewart were having their rise in tandem with, at the same time as these cable networks were having their rise. And so it was almost like John was helping the country, again, a certain swath of the country, process this new outrage machine, 24 hour cable news network world in real time because he was growing up right alongside it. And yet this is also where I think things become quite complicated for John because while a central theme of The Daily Show throughout all of its years with John was calling out media hypocrisy and the outrage games that they played and the theatrics and the absurdity and the way they had to blow things out of proportion in order to keep viewers and keep an audience going for 24 hours a day. And he railed about how they were so dramatic and about how in being so dramatic, they also had to then be divisive and they were fueling divisiveness in American politics. Sean then also himself fueled some of that divisiveness. I mean, he, he made fun of both the left and the right without a doubt, and diehards of that show will know that to be true. But clearly he was, he's a liberal person who was primarily targeting Fox News and conservative ideology. And he did it brilliantly. And I think he was, I think comedians in general are incredibly important to our society. And I think John had an incredibly important role to play in that moment in time. But I also think he may have contributed to the dehumanization almost of the other side for many people. And now I think there's something really important here, which is that John himself is somebody who understands nuance, who is an independent thinker, who can understand multiple sides of a debate. You even have people like Bill O'Reilly, who of course was a Fox News host for many decades, who John made fun of mercilessly, and who even John and he debated multiple times. You had Bill O'Reilly, when John Stewart retired, Bill penned a public farewell to John Stewart. <laughs> These are some of the things that Bill O'Reilly said about John. He said, unlike some of his soulmates, John Stewart is not a malicious man by nature. You can reason with him when he's sober. Although there are certain individuals that drive him crazy and he gives them no quarter, in that, he is human. Far more than a comedian dependent upon a squad of jaded writers, Stewart actually thinks about things from time to time. He's good at spotting phonies and is quick with a quip when challenged. And I think this is such an important point. John was so special because it really did feel like he was thinking for himself. He was making points. I think Dave Chappelle in, in a speech about John once said that John made jokes, not wokes. Uh, like he, he really, he was intentional about the things that he said and he was willing to engage with people like Bill O'Reilly. And yet, while I think all of these wonderful things can be said about Jon Stewart, they don't always translate to the audience. And, and I think this actually happens a lot with creatives where you have a creative person who is making a piece of art and that piece of art reflects something about them, how they feel, what they believe. 
and it's just a fraction perhaps of who they are and now that piece of art goes out into the world and it is taken and interpreted through the lens of an audience and people who have all sorts of different experiences and those people take that piece of art and and in some ways then turn it into something that is maybe different than what it meant to the artist so while john himself could create this piece of art that expressed a point of view that was funny that was interesting that was calling out hypocrisy and he could do all that and still still have conversations with the other side once that piece of art was out into the world it was then being received by a group of people some of whom i think aren't as capable of that as john so they're hearing these jokes they're seeing john call out this stupid embarrassing thing that somebody said on fox news or that this conservative republican said and it's fueling their vitriol and it's fueling their sense that that those people are morons and they're less than and we hate them and they're the problem and it's vitriol that i don't actually think is present in john and i don't think that's true of all of his audience members and this brings us back to megan mccain because certainly in the years since John left the airways the world has only gotten more divided, more vitriolic. It feels like people are all the more hateful. And so I wonder to some extent when Megan says that John has warped into some morphed into some woke creature, if she's reacting to who John himself has become or if she's reacting to his audience and what his audience has become and is projecting that on him in some ways. Yes, John has said things recently that I'm sure people like Megan McCain view as woke, but I also think there's a lot of evidence that John has retained an independent-mindedness. He's still close friends with Dave Chappelle. He's friends with Joe Rogan. He defended Trump voters in, in the wake of Trump's victory in 2016. Within the last couple of years, he went on Stephen Colbert and did a 10-minute comedy bit all about how obviously COVID came from the coronavirus lab in Wuhan. And that was something that was so uncopacetic in democratic circles at the time that he got a ton of blowback on social media and from, let's call it like the monolithic liberal establishment for having said those things. Of course, like months later, it would turn out that that was a, a fairly mainstream point of view. But that's exactly my point. I think this has always been the power of John is he, he cuts through bullshit and while he's certainly on the left, he thinks for himself and he'll cut through bullshit regardless of party to some degree. In any case, I am I'm incredibly excited to see what John does with this new Daily Show. John created a phenomenon. He changed the news landscape, even as he was himself a part of and reacting to and shaping the news landscape by being in it. And he brought hope at times. I think he brought moral clarity at times to a world that was grappling with what a 24 hour cable news cycle meant. And then he also inadvertently fed the divisive monster that he sought to destroy. So fundamentally, I'm, I'm interested to see in how John, 10 years on, engages with that monster now. All right, folks, that's our show. If you did enjoy this, please consider commenting, liking, subscribing. I really wanna know what you think. Are you excited John is back? Are you not? Do you hate him? Do you love him? Let me know. And with that, I'll see you next time.